about a quarter century ago when I bought my DeLorean, it was really all about the brushed stainless steel, the gullwing doors, and yeah, annoying movie references. But as for the engineering of the time, it was about the exploding plastic water coolant bottle. Here's my original one below, long since replaced with metal bottles by pretty much everybody except for concourse cars. The thermostat housing, you had to bleed like a brake because if it got air in it, the thermostat wouldn't open. This has been replaced by the auto bleeding system and the silent killer right under our nose. Everybody knows about this one. This is the cooling fan fail failure. How one little light that tells you your fans didn't work can break everything. From an engineering point of view and given the necessity that the cooling fans operate on this car, the device design, yeah, it was pretty cool. We could see a lot of my original notes here because I spent a lot of time repairing this thing. Pin 5 goes to pins 2 and 3 via coil. Coil in turn interacts with another coil and a reed switch to stop power from flowing out to pin 1. Because pin 5 also connects to pin 1. But it does so through that normally closed reed switch. So as long as the current is correct, the reed switch will be forced open and the light will not turn on. Here's my original module. We'll have a look at it. And from various courses of repair, we could see that it was taped with electrical tape at some point. Looking again, we could also see attempts were made to melt it back together. We could see in the corners, tried to heat it with a soldering iron, do whatever I had to do to get it back together, get the car back on the road. Didn't think I ever tried to epoxy it, though. That was the only thing I didn't try. But I'm going to take it apart now so we can have a look. Again, it's a great idea, but there's a fatal flaw here. We can see incoming is right over here on this pin coming in right through here. The output is these two pins on the side going to their respective fans. And to get from this input to this output, it has to go through this thick copper cable, which it wraps around a coil four times, and then is distributed out to those two outputs. At least on the output, we can see a decent amount of lead applied here from repair to manage that current. But that input, that one carries a current for both, and it's gotta take it for the team. And it doesn't work well, given the heat and the vibration. There is mechanical problems with this pin. We can see here it's probably not connected anymore. I could just pull it right out, which I will. And when that pin detaches from this board, coming from fuse number four, supplying the power to this module, it takes out the power to this fan, takes out the power to that fan, and takes out the power to the light that lets you know that the fans have failed, killing everything and making you think everything's operating fine. Couple that with the spontaneously exploding water bottle, the air bubble thermostat killer, and you have a recipe for disaster. Now this one, Elvis and I had already repaired on a trip, I think it was just after a trip to Rimini. So this was all built up, the addition of solder to augment the traces. When all that current just went through the traces, it was like a toaster oven. Once you repaired it, however, there was no nice way to get it back together. That meant tape, melting epoxy, glue, whatever you had to do. Today we have much better designs to replace the fan fail module. This one from Specialty Auto, bought it about 15 years ago or so. And while I would never recommend using one of these in a car, especially with original fans, we're going to rebuild it. The outer shell is pretty straightforward, even with this angled taper right here. There was enough to work with to get the measurements with the calipers. Whoop. The top presents a little bit of a problem because we could see that the perimeter is proud of the rest of the top cover. There's also a lettering, a font that's raised as well. So we'll have to work around that. The bottom is pretty straightforward. We just need the dimensions for the pins, but we have this one as a reference, so that should be okay. Note the taper on the original pin. Looks like in final assembly, they were all melted in a position. You can see right here, they're also numbered. So essentially we have the circuit board, the pins, this top cover, and this bottom piece. If you find it a bit off-putting that my calipers are from Chibo and not Mitutoyo, feel free to hit that thanks button on the bottom of this video and support the cause. Using FreeCAD 1.0, we could see that I'm putting some snap fit fittings on the side of these pieces, though they should be bolstered with some CA at the end. The main housing has snap fit for the top cover, as well as the bottom cover. Again, for final assembly, CA should be used. And the top plate is the simplest, fitting right into the top cover and snapping in. And all these pieces that snap into the main housing have that fine taper. Four plates have been arranged for printing. We have the main housing, the top plate, 
the bottom plate if you're using the original tapered pins. And then I made one that has a bottom plate without the taper if you're using some newer aftermarket pins. Links to the print files are available in the comments down below. So from the originals, we ended up with the prototypes. Taking the main housing, we could see the snap fit. I use a textured plate when I print, though it's not required. The snap fits look good. I'm going to take the top cover, turn it over so that the words face down, and just snap it into place. On the prototype, I won't be gluing anything in. Measured against the original, everything looks good. I did have to make my font slightly bigger. The top plate fully secured. The texture side is not seen because it is inside the module. Here's the old bottom, and here's the prototype bottom. It needs to lay perfectly flat onto the main piece. This is a little bit off, so I'm gonna straighten it out. Not critical, but it makes the next step easier. So I lay it flat, and on a flat surface, I push it down on one side, 180 degrees, push down again, then push down a smaller corner, and then the other corner to lock it into place. This piece here was just for the prototype version, allowing me to remove this cover since I did it like 50 times with a small pair of channel locks. Here's what the finished board would look like. I did all the white ones in PLA, but I will do the final revision in PETG. To that end, I've chosen a color that closely matches the original. So now we'll just wait for everything to finish printing and we'll begin our assembly. Starting with the assembly of the main housing and the top cover. Again, I'll snap it right in, securing all sides until it's perfectly seated, just like that. We'll have a look. Yeah, looks good. Putting some glue now on a broken toothpick because I don't want to over glue it and have the glue come through the other side. I'm just wiping the creases of this plastic piece where the fitting is. All four sides. Followed by a real quick burst of activator. Not much, just a little. Now it's dried. This piece is done. Place it off to the side now. We already know that this pin is loose, so I'll take it out right now. And we can see it is slightly bent, so I will straighten it with pliers. At which point, I'm going to insert it right there in the middle connector. I believe that's number four. It comes to a stop when it reaches the taper. And that's done. I'm using a soldering gun here because there's way too much solder to work with. The iron wouldn't be able to produce enough heat for this. And I'm just trying to remove a lot of that extra solder, pushing it right off the board onto this paper towel. At this point, I could clean up everything with the desoldering tool. So I go over all the holes, so I'll be able to remove the pins cleanly without causing any damage to the board or the pins. Cleaned up, they separated from the board with no issues at all. Now I tear apart the old piece with some Lyman's pliers to extract the pins from the plastic. Each pin is then cleaned up and straightened with the pliers. at which point they'll be inserted into our newly printed bottom piece. Sometimes the fit is just tight enough that to get it to the end, we're gonna use the Lyman's pliers to push it all the way to the taper. Everything here looks good on this board. We could continue with the next step. And that's gonna be gluing the pins in. We're not worried about any cosmetics here, so I could just use the bottle, followed by the wooden dowel to wick it into the recesses. Then a quick shot of activator, and this portion's done. Because the circuit board's been prepared, it should be very easy to be able to mate up these two surfaces, lining the holes. Everything pushes in, no problem at all. Flux is applied to reduce the time we're going to need to solder this, and you can see why we're using PETG, because if we use PLA, it would definitely start melting the plastic on the bottom. The PETG can hold up, though a clip-on heatsink can be used if necessary. Continuing on with that center pin, it's the last of the small ones. Things looking good so far. Make my way to the output pins now. And first, it's all about soldering those pins in. You can see I have the board kind of pitched down in my direction, so it's on an angle. But then I set it level so I could run a nice bead from one connection to the other. The same thing for the input pin, ending with a thick enough bead to hopefully hold that current. 
Check for shorts. Everything looks good. The tolerances are real close, but it's only 12 volts. We're not worried about arcing. So we're going to clean it up with alcohol to remove any of that residue. And here is the final product tested on a Henry meter for inductance as well as an ohm meter. Check it for shorts. Everything looks good. I think it's time to take a moment to reflect on, yeah, a piece that you would not ever really use in the car anymore, but it is original with regard to dimension and design and function. So, interesting. At this point, we take the outer housing and place it over, making sure everything is squared up nice. Just makes it easier to snap in. So I'm making sure it's all even. And now I could snap down the sides on the corner of the desk. There's one, flip it around, there's the other side, and then just tap the smaller sides. And it's done. Look at that. Fan fail module, brand new, reprinted. Came out nice. This shell would generally be glued at the seams, just like the top cover, but I'm gonna leave it open in case I have to remove it. And you may have noticed that my fan fail socket is in the wrong position in this car, and a lot of cars have long since been modified as to not use it anymore for whatever reason. I don't recall why mine was swapped, but I'll just remove these wires to show you that both of these sockets are employed for the use of my replacement module. But everything will be tested with the original components. And you ask, why would I bother doing any of this? Well, it does provide for a development platform for a replacement of the original fan fail module that's form fitting. But maybe that's for another video. My fans are working and I'll leave it here. I hope you found this trip down memory lane on the fan fail failure module enjoyable, entertaining and informative. Do me a favor, hit that like button down below. Helps me out a lot when you do. And hit that subscribe button to be informed of more videos like this when they come out. Again, I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Would you like to reply? <laughs>